Good evening, good evening. What's going on? Welcome to another episode of Kidney Disease Education Moment. I am your host, Steve Belcher. Thanks for joining me tonight. How's everyone doing? Yeah, so tonight, the topic we're discussing is quick access check, look, listen, and feel. Now, I thought this topic or education topic was important because all kidney warriors have an access, whether it's an AV fistula, an AV graft, or a catheter. And you have new warriors who just got access placement that may not know how to care for their access, regardless of what type of access they may have. So I thought this topic was very important and it could even be useful for warriors who are not new to dialysis and veterans who may not know uh, about access care, who may just go to treatment, get needles stuck or get hooked up to the catheter and just keep it moving. So what I want to do is give you the exact information. Hey, Jared, thanks for joining. The exact information that you need to know if you have an AV fistula, AV graft, or a catheter. Please share this video in any groups where you may see uh, new people who may be getting accesses or you see posts where they're talking about their family member just got a AV fistula or AV graft or a catheter, please share this because this is very important for them as well. Now I'm gonna read you something out of a book from a Lifeline book, uh, Preserving Your Access Care. And this information, I can't stress it enough, does not get uh, taught to kidney warriors at the clinic because units are, a lot of units are understaffed or just the process of working where staff don't have the time to sit down and tell you about your access. How many of you went to have access care? You come back to bandage, they may not address the bandage or not even gave you any information on what to do and what not to do other than what the surgeon may have told you. But it's important that you know a lot more than what just the surgeon may tell you. So I'm gonna start this education. Hey, Lawrence, thanks for joining. I'm gonna start this education moment off with an introduction. Vascular access is one of the most critical elements of successful dialysis care. It really is. Since fistulas work better than any other type of access, Medicare has set goals for kidney doctors and dialysis providers to increase the number of patients using this type of vascular access. Making improvements in vascular access will require everyone to work as a team. As the warrior, you are the most important member of this team. Remember that. As the patient, warrior, however you want to coin it, when it comes to your access, you are the most important person. So that means you have a lot of say so in what you want to see done or not done with your access care. And the more information you know about it, the better you be on. If you're in the stage and you haven't gotten this yet, you'll be in a better informed way to make a decision uh, what's best for you. So let's talk about the types of vascular access for hemodialysis. And the warriors, if you're watching, we all know. So for um, potential warriors or family members of potential warriors that may be watching, we're going to talk about the types of vascular access that are used for hemodialysis. First one is a fistula. A fistula is a natural type of vascular access where your own veins is surgically connected to an artery, okay? 
the increased blood flow that flows from this connection causes the vein to enlarge and the vein walls to strengthen. However, if you have diabetes, type one, and maybe type two, but normally type one, a lot of warriors with type one have complications getting this type of fistula because their veins are so small and the diabetes has uh, destroyed the veins to a um, certain degree. Um, because the fistula is placed completely under the skin, it is called an internal vascular access. Needles must be used to access the bloodstream for dialysis. And I showed you the needles before. I'm not going to step away to get them, but they're 16 gauge needles, 15, 14, uh, multiple sizes. Overall, the fistula is the preferred vascular access for hemodialysis because of its low complication rate. Hey, Carrie, thanks for joining. So and the reason why it's a low complication rate using the fistula is because it's your own natural veins. It's not a piece of tubing. It's not um, a catheter, it's your own vein. So the majority of the complications would come from infiltration or infection. The next type of access that's used is a graft. Many warriors have AV grafts. Now, this is exactly what a graft is, okay? A graft is a synthetic tubing that's surgically connected to your blood vessels. Well, let me let me point out and show y'all. This is, uh, I'm sorry. This is the graph. And then this is the, the fistula, the first one. So, um, just like the fistula, it is placed completely under the skin, and therefore it is called an internal vascular access. Needles must be used to access the bloodstream for dialysis. Again, let, let me step away and get the needles to show y'all guys. So this is one of the needles. This is a um, 15 gauge hemodialysis needle, 15 gauge, one inch. They do have a size uh, one and a one quarter. And the one and the one quarter are for warriors who may be somewhat obese and they, their arms are large and the access may be deep. And so the, the needle one and uh, one quarter comes about right there and you can just go deep down inside. Um, so this is, like I said, a 15 gauge needle. Uh, so uh, because the graft is made of artificial material, it is more likely to develop complications and does not generally last as long as fistulas. So the graft, because of the synthetic tubing, and this, it's like a, it's not like, it's, I don't wanna say similar to this, but it's more flimsy. If you've seen the uh, Gore-Tex graft material, Something like this. It could be a straight graph. It could be a loop graph. And it goes right under the skin. And the reason why you can get complications with the graph is because of the material that can get infected. If you repeatedly stick in the same area or text um, or not washing their hands and 
using gloves, they can get your arm infected. So that's why it's very important to wash your access before you come into treatment. And again, when the technicians, um, right before they stick, they need to clean your arm, prep it, and make sure that they have on some gloves, clean gloves, washing their hands before they stick you. The next type of access is a catheter, subclavian catheter. That's this guy right here. Subclavian catheter. Now, let me tell you what a catheter is. A catheter is also known as a central venous catheter or CVC for short is a tube-like device that is inserted into a large vein, usually in the neck, and it could be in the groin area. If they can't, if they run out of spots up here, they put it down in the uh, femoral groin, or the femoral artery. Because um, two small tubes with caps permanently lie outside of the body, while the catheter is implanted, it is called an external device. Um, I had I had a um, an example of a catheter, but it's two prongs that come out, and that's why they call it external because they extend out of you, and they have two caps that they keep on of the ports. Um, the remainder of the catheter, the port you do not see, travels under the skin and into a vein. Ultimately, the internal end of the uh, catheter rests in the top chamber of the heart. So this catheter, is the, the tip of it is going in the heart. Okay. In order to access the bloodstream for dialysis, the two outside tubes are connected to the dialysis machine. Because so much of the catheter resides outside of the body, it is exposed to many more risks. That's why they want to get this catheter out as soon as possible because of the high risk of infections. It is exposed to many more risks, including infection. The relatively higher level of risk associated with a catheter makes it the least, again, it makes it the least desirable type of vascular access. So basically they don't want you to have the catheter, but the majority of patients, when they come out of the hospital, they have catheters, but they wanna get rid of that as soon as possible. We talked with Vern Tasker last night on Urban Reno Talk with Tamika and Steve, Reno Ward that's been on for two years. She still has her catheter. So, and she had multiple surgeries because of the diabetes that affected her veins. So everybody's situation is different. And if you can keep that catheter clean and not get it infected, and you're going to going through multiple problems with your uh, fistula or graft then it may be best that you keep the catheter. I know warriors who had that catheter for five years. Like I said, everybody's different. Um, it can potentially lead to many complications is therefore intended to serve only as a short-term vascular access until an internal access can be established. I know a lot of warriors that hesitate getting this taken out because it's convenient and they don't want to get stuck by these needles. I mean, who would? Who would? And I take my hat off to warriors that go through this three times a week of getting cannulated with these needles. And I believe the more you know, if you're in, in any one of the stages of, ki of kidney disease, it's pertinent that you know this. If you're in stage three, don't let a doctor come to you and say, let's talk about getting the access place. I know warriors who are at stage four 
uh, pretty much at stage five and still don't have an access, still keeping kidney disease at bay. So just be an advocate, soak in the information. You can do the research yourself, but this information is solid. And if you notice, and if you're in one of the stages of kidney disease, you can make a better informed decision. So let's get into the meat of this. If you have an access, okay, whether it's a AV fistula, AV graft, or a um, or catheter, you or the caregiver at hemodialysis should be doing a physical assessment of your vascular access. This is what's called preserving your vascular access or your lifeline. And if you don't know how to do that, it's important that you listen to this part of it. So if no one does it at the center, at least you know how to do it and you can take care of yourself. Okay, your access allows you to receive life-saving dialysis treatments. Because of this, it is commonly referred to as your lifeline. A well-functioning access is necessary to achieve maximum Again, a well-functioning access is necessary to achieve maximum dialysis efficiency. When dialysis treatments become inefficient or inadequate, and you can tell if your treatments are inefficient or inadequate by looking at two things, your KT over V and your URR. Uh, your URR is your reduction ratio, and that measure how much urea is being uh, filtered out. And the KT over V is the number also uh, to see the quality of treatment that you're getting. These two numbers alone uh, can be affected by your access. If, if your access is not working properly, whether you have a catheter, fistula, or graft, it can uh, critically mess up your treatment and you're not getting in that you're getting inadequate treatment um particularly okay now it says when dialysis treatments become inefficient or inadequate toxins accumulate in the body potentially impacting your quality of life so if your access is not working or he's working inefficient or inadequate and you feeling sluggish or you don't feel right, you're not getting a good dialysis, this is impacting the quality of your life. And you should know this. You should know this. By paying attention to the health of your access and making sure problems with it are fixed right away, your access will last longer. Now, how many warriors out there have multiple accesses? I've met many warriors that had three, four, five, six accesses. Uh, lower left arm, upper left arm, lower right arm, upper right arm, uh, both legs. And then the last um, option was a catheter. I've I seen this. And... It should be no way that someone should have multiple accesses like that and not question it or what's going on. If, if the first access is going on, why is this happening? What's causing it? How can we prevent it? So if you know, and if you're headed down that road, if you're in stage five or you're at a point where they want you to get an access, please just take this information for what it's worth and just be mindful so you don't have multiple surgeries. We had a guest on Sisters Against Kidney Disease, uh, Phyllis Pinkettos author of Chosen to Triumph. She had 27 procedures on her arm, 27. The question is, when do you start asking what's going on and why so many surgeries? So, 
by paying attention to the health of your access and making sure problems with it are fixed right away, your access will last longer. Changes within your access are oftentimes subtle and take weeks, even months to develop. So something could be going on right now and you don't even know about it. It could be building up. Because of this, it is important to evaluate your access every day. So it could be something developing. And if you don't know how to um, do an assessment of your access, you could be potentially building up to something that could be catastrophic. And I hate to be um, kind of over-exaggerating, but it can. It can be catastrophic. I seen a patient who used to always bleed in the clinic and he, he had to wait until he left home for him to stop bleeding. One day this gentleman went home, he stopped bleeding and he went home and unfortunately he bled to death in his sleep. He had an AV fistula. We don't know what happened but he bled to death in his sleep. And I know other warriors that this has happened to. That's why this is so important to be mindful and make an assessment and check your lifelines. Patients that have adopted the look, feel, and listen process of physical assessment quickly quickly realize how important frequent monitoring is. By following the three steps as outlined here, you can familiarize yourself with your access. Get to know your access. Don't be afraid of it or because it's there, be ashamed of it. Get to know your lifeline because at the end of the day, it really is your lifeline. Um, and you want to know how it works and how to properly care for your lifeline. So number one, look, inspect the skin, inspect the skin over your access, changes in skin color, swelling, redness, and enlar enlarging bumps are not normal. And what I wanted to share with that, when you look, make sure you're looking for any discharge or pus that may be coming out of the site where you was last stuck or, <clears throat> excuse me, if you just got access surgery done, make sure down at the excision site, which is also called the anastomosis, that there's no um, thick pus coming out, yellowish, greenish pus coming out, even coming out of your access site. I've seen warriors who access may have gotten what they are called aneurysms, those big bumps, and they may want you, they may want the caregiver to go at the same, uh, in the same spot each time. And that can cause an infection breakdown in the skin. And I've seen warriors that this crusted up, really getting infected. So please, you know, you, you want to take care of your access. Make sure you're using soap and water, no petroleum jelly. That's the last thing you want to put on your access is petroleum jelly because it, it attracts dirt. The petroleum tracks dirt and locks it in. And that's the last thing you want on your access is dirt because then it can get into your bloodstream and cause a bloodstream infection. So please, and, and I encourage you to, to get non-toxin soap if you can when you wash your access because a lot of these um, hand wash Gels got chemicals in it. So that's also uh, 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 a warning sign as well. So as I said, changes in the skin color, swelling, redness, and enlarging bumps are not normal. 
allow the scabs. Now, this is important. When they pull a needle and you stop bleeding, allow the scabs over previous cannulation sites to completely heal. Do not disrupt them. Uh, some warriors may take a shower at night and disrupt it or whatever. You, you want to make sure they completely heal because if you don't and you open that up, you're setting yourself up to possibly uh, to prolong bleeding as well as infection, especially if you're taking a shower or a bath. Now, this is very important. I just thought about this. If you have a laid graph, OK, if you have a graph or access in your leg, you want to be careful if you take a bath. The reason why, because of the water that's coming out of the faucet that's coming from the city. And if you don't have a water filtration system to filter out the calcium and the chlorine and the bacteria and stuff like that, that comes out of that water and you have a leg graph and you had surgery or some type of procedure and you're sitting in that water, the germs is sitting in there. So you're kind of sitting in a cesspool of germs. And even if you have an access up here in your arm or your lower arm and you especially have a, um, a, a, a soaking tub and you're doing that, so be just be mindful of that. And if you want to do that, you may want to invest in some Tegaderm um, op sites like sealants to put over your access, but just, just be mindful of stuff like that because those little type of tidbit tips can prevent you from getting an infection where you figure out one day you're okay and then two days later you have a temp of 100 and you want to know how did you get this bloodstream infection and they're drawing cultures and all this and you don't have a cath and you wonder how did I get this infection? So always check your access. Just make sure you clean it with soap and water. That's the best to clean your access with is soap and water. Um, I don't know about chlorhexidine. Uh, some patients break out with these uh, antimicrobial um, type of solutions, but the best basic is soap and water. Okay, so feel. This is the second step of the look, feel, and listen assessment of your access. Run your hand. If your access is right here, if your access is right here, you want to run your hand gently across your access. You will feel a distinct buzzing feeling known as a thrill. And even if it's down here in your lower arm, you feel down there. No, um, Donna, no special soap, even though I would say toxin-free. Um, Modere, of course, I'm going to say that because I advertise with Modere, but uh, even not that, uh, Tom soap, uh, soap from Wegmans, natural soap. Uh, from Mother's Farm. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tamika James, if I, from Mother's Garden, I believe she has uh, natural soap, but just natural soap. But if you can't get that, just soap and water. I'm not going to get too technical, but just soap and water. But if you had an access in your lower arm, you just run your hand across your access. You will feel a distinct buzzing feeling known as a thrill starting at the incision line where the artery and vein are connected to form your access. So if your incision is down here, you want to start from down here because like I said in the beginning, this is called the anastomosis. Wherever that surgical incision is, where that starts, that's the anastomosis. And you do not, I repeat, do not have any new technician. Veterans know about this, but if you fall, um, uh, if, if you get assigned to a technician that's new in dialysis, you just start, make sure they stay away from the junction area called the anastomosis. Because if you stick there, you, you're going to have some problems. You're going to bleed. You're going to pop. You, you could bleed to death, 
but you're going to be bleeding because that's where the main junction is. Okay, so stay from down there, go up here, but start to fill up to make sure that you got that pulsation down here because if that pulsation is not coming from this junction because that's where the blood is coming through, it's not working. Starting at the incision line where the artery and vein are connected to form your axis, run your hand across the entire length of the axis. The thrill should be strong as, like I said, at the incision line and should gradually fade as you move your hand up to the axis, okay? If you have a fistula, it should feel soft and it can be compressed easily. If you have a graft, it will feel firm or hard because of that tubing and tube light. Note, a strong pulse in the fistula or graft without gentle thrill is not normal. I want to repeat that one more time. A strong pulse in the fistula or graft without a gentle thrill is not normal. So let's talk about, Steve, the red information blocks us from seeing your arm. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, buddy. Sorry about that. So let me just go back over. Sorry, Lawrence. But what I was saying, Lawrence, was if someone for the feel, let me do this arm. So wait a minute. I'm trying to get some of the camera get there. So for the feel, say the fistula was Right here, normally where a lot of warriors, they have like the upper arm fistula or lower. So let me start from right here. If you have, normally if you have an upper arm graft or fistula, um, this is normally where the junction is, where they're doing a surgical incision called the nastomosis. And this is where you want people to stay away from sticking. Some patients may have to do that because they may not have a space to stick and the surgeon may say, Okay, it's good to stick around there, but they're using uh, 16, 17 gauge needles. If you have the access down here, okay, the nastomosis is normally down in this area right here. That's where the surgical incision is. So you would feel from right here and move your arm up gently to see if you can feel the thrill. And even down here, if you get assigned to a new technician, do not have them stick down here. That's where anastomosis could be at, where they surgically tie your veins as well. You may see people with accesses right up here, uh, a fistula, so, and the surgical ties down there. So don't let anyone stick down there. And I don't care, not even veterans, until you clear with your surgeon. So the physical assessment of your vascular access this is the, the third step is uh, listening. Listening to your access and knowing the meaning of the sounds that you hear can help you detect common complications. Now, with this, excuse me, you would need a stethoscope that you can get from, I mean, maybe your dialysis clinic may give you one, but you can get it for from, you know, medical store, CVS, drugstore, um, nursing, uniform store. So Amazon, <laughs> I mean, you can get a stethoscope, but you would get one. And um, what you do is you put, you know, you put the stethoscope on. Oh, let me get my stethoscope. So this is, I mean, we all know, well, I'm not going to assume everybody know what a stethoscope is, but this is a stethoscope right here. Um, and so what this does, you can, you know, listen for lung sounds and heart sounds and just different sounds throughout uh, the body. But 
what you would do is go ahead and put it in. And again, if your access was, was down here, you just put it on. Access was up here. Put it up here. Listen for the listen, listen for the swooshing sound. Um, so when listening to a fistula or a graph, you will hear a swooshing, well, whooshing sound called a bruit. That sound is called a bruit. A normal bruit will be low pitched and continuous. Begin listening at the incision line and move up the entire length of your access like I showed you when filling. The bruit should be strongest at the incision line and should gradually fade as you move up the access, just like when you fill it. If no stethoscope is available, you can position your ear over your access to determine if the flow sound is present. So if you don't have a stethoscope to listen, again, if your access is here, you can listen, put your ear over your access to hear for the swooshing, same up there, same, same, and listen for that. So let me get into the next. This is very important um, what I'm about to talk about now because this involves common vascular complications that I'm sure many, many warriors have experienced in their uh, life dealing with this disease, um, vascular access complications. Whether it's stenosis, thrombosis, or aneurysms, or infection, someone has experienced this. So these are the common vascular access complications, and this is what they are. Stenosis, a narrowing inside a fistula or graph that restricts blood flow through an access. So if you have, say, for instance, you have stenosis, this your access is going to be stenosed. It's going to restrict the blood from moving through the tubing of your access. So it's going, it's going to be narrowing wherever it is. It's going to be narrow. There are several warning signs that may indicate that a stenosis is in, that is present. Okay, during your dialysis treatment, a stenosis can cause arterial or venous pressure alarms. Be aware of these alarms, what they mean and how often they ring. So if your machine is going off multiple times, your arterial venous, and you're not aware of this, if you're just sleeping and you're not aware of your treatment and this is happening, and the technicians, they just resetting it, resetting the alarm, resetting the alarm, you won't know if you have any problems. That's why it's, it's mindful to know what's going on and then not get caught at the end of the day when you end up in the surgeon's office wondering how this happened. So, during your, di during your dialysis treatment, a stenosis can cause arterial or venous pressure alarms. Be aware of these alarms, what they mean, and how often they ring. A stenosis can also extend the length of time that you must apply pressure to the needle site after dialysis to control the bleeding. So if you're bleeding for a long period of time, that could be a, a sign of stenosis. Be aware of increased bleeding times or bleeding that restarts after it has stopped. Difficulty with needle placement may result from access stenosis. Be aware of changes in the level of discomfort you experience when the dialysis needles are inserted and removed. Again, these are all 
common signs of stenosis. And a lot of people are not aware when they had these problems or issues and they may go into a group and say, uh, for instance, you may somebody may go in the group and say, oh, I've been bleeding a lot longer than what I used to. Have anybody else experienced this? I don't know what to do or the center don't know what to do. They cut my heparin. I'm still doing this. Well, had they thought about stenosis or going to get your access checked? Even with the needle placement. Okay, Th these are all simple um, signs that technicians and nurses should be washing out for if they having trouble with your access. That's why it's very important to know your access and know this information because if you don't know it and they don't know it, I mean, what's going to happen? Your access is going to be messed up and you're going to be having multiple accesses. And, and some of these multiple accesses are, um, are unnecessary. I'm sure that there are a lot of sur a lot of surgeries that's happened with warriors that were unnecessary. You're not going to tell me it wasn't. Also, your bruit and thrill will be affected by stenosis. Okay, how you feel it and what you listen to will be affected. Perform the access evaluation daily. That's how you would know if you have a stenosis. If you know how to do the access check daily, you get up in a, it doesn't take nothing but five minutes to get up and check your access. Look at it, get up in the morning, any anything going on, any redness, any uh, swelling, any discharge, um, any uh, changes in skin, any shiny skin. So you want to make sure you do that assessment when you get up. You look. Look and make sure no discharge. And you feel with your hand for the brewing or the thrill. That's it. If you do that, then you will save yourself a lot of unnecessary uh, complications uh, from stenosis. Okay, again, be aware of changes in the whooshing sound of your bruit and the buzzing feeling of your thrill. Note, if left untreated, this is a very important, if you have stenosis, if left untreated, a stenosis can evolve into a thrombosis. Now, I want to tell you, good question, Vincent. The redness signifies infection is brewing. If it's red, if it's warm or hot, and you, and you feel like you got a temperature, chills, that's an infection brewing, my brother. So the redness signifies infection, especially the swelling. And you see that a lot with grafts because of the material, the graft. Like if you steadily stick in, now this is how the infection is introduced into the bloodstream, especially with the grafts. Um, the grafts are... are more easy to get infected than the fistula. The fistula can get infected, but the grass are more easy. And this is why, because of the material that's used inside for the graph, the Gore-Tex material. Now, just think. Now, if I'm a, you know, if I'm in there getting ready to stick you, right? And some of you may have seen this. I, I've seen this many times. Say someone is getting ready to stick you, okay? Put the needle in. And you're ready to put it in. And all of a sudden, the machine or something alarms or something falls. And right before they get in, they, oh, hold on, I'll be right back. And they walk away and they're holding this needle like this. And they go do something. Well, what about the germs that's already uh, 
circulating in the air. We can't see the microbes that's, that's, that's circulating in the air. But just even that, you got people who's coughing in the unit, sneezing, all kind of germs that's floating around. But they walking around with this and then they sticking in the access and you have a graph, which is a synthetic man-made material. Those germs get on that graph. Boom. Infection is that's where the infection comes from, because what it is, it, it, when you stick the needle in the access, it introduces right there. So it may not heal when it's trying to heal. Um. It may not heal all the way. You may start seeing crusting and pus. And that's where you see the body trying to expel the, the infection out through that, through that access. And so it's very important that you check for the redness and all that stuff. Even if you're a veteran and you have an access and you got shiny skin and you have uh, the aneurysms, make sure that you're checking it every day and try to stay away from the same areas and rotate your site, please. Uh, the second complication, common vascular complication is thrombosis or my access clotted. You may hear warriors say my access stopped working, it clotted. Um, and thrombosis, which is the medical name or medical jargon is pretty much the formation of a blood clot inside a fistula or graft that completely obstructs blood flow through the access. So what happens with the narrowing and how I said, if it's left untreated, uh, unnoticed, that it can evolve into a thrombosis because look, say this is the, say this is the graft or your access to fistula right here. And if you have a narrowing, and we all know where the narrowing, like I'm squeezing it, the blood can't flow through the access. And if it can't flow through, then it's going to stop. And that's where the thrombosis or the clot comes in because the blood is not moving through the access and circulating throughout your body. So it's going to pretty much stand still and cause a blockage. And how you would notice that on the, on when you go to dialysis. Now, this, this is important what I'm about to say. It will save you time and energy. If you checked your, if, if warriors check the access before they come to dialysis, if they did this assessment, that will save you time from coming in. And if we do it and if you clot it, then you got to go back home. Or if they have an opening at the access center, you may have to, you could go there from the unit, but you got to wait. And I can't tell you, honestly, how many warriors in my career that came to the unit and they found out that they were clotted. I can't count it on my hands. Now, just think of those warriors, if they would have checked their arm before they came to dialysis, how much time, effort, money, and resources they could have uh, they could have saved coming into the unit, finding out that they clotted, and then going to the surgeon's office or to the access center. So please. Do this assessment if you're a warrior before you go to treatment to save yourself some time. Now, a loss of brewing and thrill are key signs that the access may be clotted. A thrombosis can also cause pain in your access and surrounding area. So if your access stops working, if it's clotted, that's it can cause pain. It is crucial that a thrombectomy. And all that is, is a declot procedure. We're going to the access center to get declotted or get a thrombectomy. Be performed as soon as possible. If that, now listen, I've seen warriors not get that thrombectomy and they ended up losing the access and had to get another access. The sooner you get that declot, the better you are to save that access. That's very important. 
as the length of time increases before a thrombosis is resolved, the likelihood that a decline procedure will be successful decreases. Because a clotted access has no flow going through it, your access is not able to be used for dialysis and may lead to catheter placement. Aneurysm, a localized bulging out of the fistula raw. Now we know there's a lot of warriors out there that have these aneurysms. There are a lot. In fact, one of our one of our associates, Jermaine Fingers, down in Indiana, he had aneurysms, and he went and got surgery and got them uh, excised or or cut down. And the way to avoid aneurysms is do not stick in the same area. You have to rotate your needle sites. Two finger. So if you stick the, I'm sorry, if you stick here today, you want to stick two finger widths apart from the last area you stuck from. I know it's a new area, but in the long run, this will save your access from getting the aneurysms. Now, a pseudoaneurysm is a localized bulging out due to breakdown of the graft material. So again, the pseudoaneurysm is the localized bulging. Like if you have a graft and you're trying to figure out why is that bulge there? Because wherever you're sticking at that graft, it was a breakdown of, uh, of the material because of what we call one sciitis. Um, Donna, that's a good question. Medically, I don't know, but as a nurse, and and I'm going to do a critical assessment and think about that. If you have a clot in your arm. There's always, or anywhere in your body, let me just say that, there's always a risk of it breaking off and traveling through your bloodstream to cause a stroke or pulmonary embolism. So that's why, you know, people who are at risk for this, they're on blood thinners. Uh, one, uh, particular is Coumadin or Warfarin. Uh, another one is Placid, Plavix. Okay. But, and you can take a baby aspirin each day. That would also help thin your blood. But normally, check with your doctors as usual if you decide or, or think about. Um, wanting to take a baby aspirin or or um, check into blood thinners. You may not need it, but patients who are at risk for clotting a lot of times have to be on blood thinners. Now, it says here, an aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm is visible on the skin surface as a localized bump or bulge in the access. Their presence can be cause for concern if the size increases or if the skin over it becomes thin and shiny. And that's why I said earlier, if you have a pseudoaneurysm or aneurysm and the bulges get bigger and the skin over that is shiny, it's, it's some great concern for that. One, infection, two, possible um, uh, bleeding. Serious bleeding can develop from that. It can pop and you can bleed to death. I, I didn't see it, but I've known cases of this to occur. Patients bleeding to death because of a 
uh, ruptured access from pseudo aneurysm or aneurysm. And uh, last but not least, uh, the common vascular complication is infection. Presence of bacteria in the vascular access and or bloodstream. Remember to always pay careful attention to your general health. The presence of fever or chills is a sign of a potential infection. An infection can also cause changes in the appearance or feel of your access. Again, Vincent, check this out. Redness, drainage, swelling, or localized pain at your access site can be a sign of infection. Notify your kidney doctor and or dialysis caregivers if you detect any changes in your access. Report signs of thrombosis or infection immediately. If you wake up and you don't feel nothing or you got some discharge coming out after you know you're doing that that assessment, the uh, look, feel, and listen method, call the unit. Don't go in there. Call them because it'll be a waste of time to go in because you'll, you'll sit there and wait um, while they're putting on other warriors and do what they got to do, and then they'll take care of your situation. Uh, it says, seek immediate medical attention for uncontrolled bleeding from aneurysms or cannulation sites apply and hold pressure over bleeding sites. We had a warrior on our show and I can't remember who it was who told me they were driving home one day and their access started bleeding in the car on their way home. And they had to turn back around and come back to dialysis. I've seen that many times, many times where warriors left out, had their coat on, everything. And then 10, 15 minutes later, coming back in, coat bloody inside the coat, um, you know, all over the arm. Uh, I've known warriors who got on the uh, bus. This happened. They start bleeding on the bus. So please, please, I beg you to do the look, listen, and feel method and be more mindful of access care in these common vascular access complications. Now, let me just go over with you as, as we come to uh, somewhat a conclusion of this education moment. The general rules of access care. These are general rules. These are common rules that you should be doing that your dialysis treatment team should be telling you if you have an access for fistulas or grafts. Keep the skin cover, keep the skin over your access clean. Avoid sleeping on your access arm. Protect your arm from injury. Do not allow blood to be drawn, IVs to be inserted, or blood pressure measurements to be taken on your access arm. Wear loose clothing, nothing tight fitting around, you know, that access. Um, wear loose clothing and avoid, avoid jewelry over the access. For catheters, if you have a catheter, keep your dressing dry and intact, okay? Let me tell you what the clinics have started doing. This is a shame and I wanna talk about it because again, your access is your lifeline, but this is what they started doing to cut costs. And if you're a warrior and you have a catheter, you should know and you would know that now instead of using what they used to use called tegaderms, what they put in the hospital, it's a sealant type of dressing to keep it compressed and sealed. Now they're using just regular gauze and paper tape. How, I mean, if you're on here and you're watching and you have a catheter and you have paper tape and dressing, please 
give me a thumbs up or or just acknowledge that. But this is what they're doing. Unless you have access to the medical supply store or on Amazon where you're buying the Tegaderms or whatever type of um, subclavian or CVC dressing that covers over your dressing. You're not just using paper tape and a single gauze. I've seen warriors come back to treatment with the whole gauze missing. And what about the summertime when it's hot and you're sweating? That bandage is not going to stay on all day, just paper tape and gauze. And then you got to think about the adhesive that that sticks to your skin around the, around the catheter. And then on the um, on the catheter hubs, um, the limbs, when you, some uh, uh, warriors request the caregiver to wrap tape around it, you don't want to do that because that paper tape has adhesive on it and it breathes infection. Um, yes. <sighs> yes, yes. You're right, Joyce. Thanks for tuning in. But Joyce, that's where with this information, and if you're armed with it, you can be your own health advocate and you know make sure that you're getting the correct treatment and services. It, you know, if if you can't get the Tegaderm from there, you know, if you try to order them from uh, Amazon or somewhere, if not, then just make sure with that gauze. See if you can get some sterile ones to take home with you, some gloves, and possibly get some ant antiseptic ointment. And if that dressing comes off, do the dressing care yourself. Um, I hate to say that. I'm not encouraging that, but I know a lot of warriors who who do do that, clean their site and maintain it because, I mean, to air is human. I mean, to human, it, whatever that way it goes, but human makes mistakes as well. So for, for the catheter, keep your dressing dry and intact. Do not use sharp instruments such as scissors scissors near your catheter and do not use your catheter for anything other than dialysis. Unfortunately, I seen warriors. I didn't see it with my eyes, but I have known or heard of warriors in the inner city use their catheters to in inject heroin or drugs inside their catheters. And that's unfortunate. That is Really, really unfortunate. So as clothing, this is the role of the dialysis caregiver in preserving your vascular access. This is their role. This is what they're supposed to be doing. As Joyce says, because they don't give a damn, uh, you just a number. But I want to read you the roles that the dialysis caregivers are should be doing okay and if they're not you can hold them accountable or talk to the administrator or charge nurse and if you go that route they don't do it call the state whatever agency is watching over your dialysis unit call them if you don't feel like your uh, concerns are being met. The role of the dialysis caregiver. Your dialysis caregiver should wash their hands. Okay, let me repeat that again. Wash their hands and change their gloves before caring for you. Okay, L let me repeat that again because this is not happening in a lot of facilities, okay? Now, they may be using hand gel, but I've seen a lot of caregivers 
just when they ready to when you walk in, you sit in the chair, get ready for your treatment. I seen caregivers been be sitting there, you know, at the desk, like waiting, you know, person away. You know, they sitting there, they may be on the phone, looking down, doing that, whatever. And they may be waiting, and then they get up and get a you know, get the gloves on and and go start working with the with the client. Instead of getting up, <laughs> going to the sink where it's right behind them or on the side, washing your hands and putting on your gloves. Okay. Two, the caregiver should look, feel, and listen to your access before every treatment. <laughs> how many, how many times have you sat in a chair and they come prep your arm up and just put the needle in? I mean, do they take the time and say, hold? I mean, now not let me let me take this back because I don't want to generalize and say all. Uh, caregivers do that. But no, no, we, we do follow procedures and protocols and that's supposed to happen. That's what's supposed to happen. They're supposed to listen to your access, look at it and feel. There's one method they use where they lift your arm up to see if the access collapse far as if you have a fistula to see if the blood is flowing through there. But that's what we should be doing. OK, and if that's not happening. <laughs> then you need to say something. If no one's expecting your access before they put you on, they just stick in the needle. Now, how many times has this happened? They stuck, they didn't check your access. They stuck the needle in and your arm was clotted. Now, early in my career, I'm guilty of that. I'm not going to, I won't deny that. Before I pretty much, I changed my whole thinking process around about this early in my career because I didn't know any better. OK, so we, we, we definitely got to use the assessment method to check your arm before you go on. So before we stick the needles in. So if we know it's clotted before we put the needle in, it saves the warrior uh, a lot of time and pain, much pain, though. The caregiver should always clean the skin over your access well before needle placement. Always clean the skin over your access well before needle placement. How many people, uh, warriors, had the caregiver use a small alcohol pad and just do like that and then stick the needle in? You know what well means? Here it says, all, always clean the skin over your access well before needle placement. Well doesn't mean like that and that's it. You got to start from the end and go out, okay? In and circular motion and go out. And now they give us these small alcohol pads that that are cheap crap and don't serve the purpose. And they went away from the large alcohol that saturated with alcohol that able to prep the arm. You may see this in your unit. This is where they're cutting costs. The caregiver should be rotating the needle placement sites to prevent breakdown of vessels or graft material. Let me repeat that one more time. The caregiver should rotate the needle placement sites to prevent breakdown or vessel, I'm sorry, to prevent breakdown of vessel or graft material. It's telling you right there, um, if you stick in the same place, you're gonna have breakdown of the vessel or grab material. So that's why you have to rotate the sites. If you don't rotate the sites, you're gonna get an aneurysm or breakdown of the fistula or graft material. Avoid sticking, avoid sticking aneurysms or pseudoaneurysm if possible. How many technicians 
have you seen just go right there into the aneurysm? I mean, you should be avoiding that. A lot of people go there because that's the easiest place to stick. And if you, a lot of warriors just leave it up to the technician or the caregiver, the nurse, tech, whoever's putting the needle in, they leave it up to them to put it in. So if you're just sitting there holding your arm or letting them do that, they may say, oh, this is an easy spot for me. I just want to get it in and get the treatment started. Of course, they're going to go at the easiest um, place. And that doesn't that doesn't serve you justice in the long run because your arm is going to break down and cause the aneurysm. So I hate to say this, but the caregiver and the and the warrior are pretty much at fault. Well, I don't want to say at fault, but reasons why these aneurysms develop because if you don't tell the caregiver not to go there. Hey, don't stick me there. I want you to stick me right here. Boom. Next time you come to treatment, no, go right here. This is where I want you to stick me. Next tra treatment, <laughs> I want you to, right? You're right, Joyce. Go right here. You know, I've worked with warriors who directed me where they wanted me to go, and I'm much obliged. I'm not one to not, hey, I don't have any airs or anything like that. I'm not too good for a warrior to tell me where they want me to cannulate or put the needle in their arm, especially if they're a veteran at this and they know. But if I see something before I cannulate or stick the arm that I feel that's not safe or I shouldn't go at that particular spot, but go in another spot that's not the same spot that was previous stick, that was previous cannulated. Of course, I'm going to uh, give them my suggestions, but I'm not going to not dismiss or say no. I'm not going to. That's not no. We're, we're supposed to listen, and and that's where a warrior wants you to cannulate, and it's two inches, uh, two uh, two finger breaths apart from the last site and it's a good area, then we should be abiding by their wishes. Especially, you got to avoid sticking in those bumps, people. If you have aneurysms right now, my suggestion would be to see if you can get them cut down, especially if they're large and, and you're feeling uncomfortable with them, to get them cut down and see if uh, you can start new and have caregivers rotate your site. Even now, when you go back in the treatment, see where you got where you got more access. I've seen patients, warriors have. Let me take this down right quick. So I seen a stick warriors right here, right. The graph access go all the way up, right, all the way up. And they just sticking right here, and they got all this space. Still, like you, you, you won't even, you can't even tell that there's an access there because no one went up higher. And you know why? Because several reasons. The warrior may say, "No, don't go up there. I don't, I don't want to go up there. You can't get it." Or the the technician or nurse say, "You know, I don't want to go up there. It's a new spot." It's a, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. And you got to use the whole access. I can't stress that enough. And if you use the whole access and you're mindful, you can save yourself a lot of time from going to the emergency room and staying out of the access center or your surgeon's office. That Now, this is... This is happening, but a lot of times this is not happening. This next one, the dialysis caregiver should teach you, but it says when possible to properly hold pressure to your access site when needles are removed after your treatment. Next one, the dialysis caregiver should check your catheter access site. 
for signs and symptoms of infection prior to start of your treatment. So when you go on, before you go on, they should be cleaning your access before starting the treatment. Now, I'm one guilty of when I was working in dialysis, uh, I've been guilty of cleaning the access uh, between treatment and even sometime after treatment. And there's no excuse, but let me say this. Sometime the company or the corporation creates an environment for dialysis caregivers, they create an environment of the rush mentality. It wants you to get a person on the machine. They want, they want you to do this, 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 and this. And they don't give you time to do quality care, okay? They are set up to where you, you're putting somebody on and you, you, you're cleaning the catheter. Then you have another client that comes in. Then you have another client that comes in and it kind of creates the, I got to get these people on. They're sitting there waiting. The people waiting may make some noise or like was taking so long. You have a lot of people that are impatient. Not This is not happening a, a lot of times, but I experienced this a lot. So Companies normally create this environment. There was a time in dialysis back in my early career, 80s and 90s, where we were able to finish a shift, close down the shift for a second, make sure all the warriors got out, everything was safe, cleaned up, took, we de we, we kind of took a breather for a moment and you know, thank you, Ms. Baxter. Thanks for tuning in. And we were able just to just kind of decompress for the moment, you know, because let me just say this as a as a dialysis caregiver or ex-caregiver, even though dialysis looks simple, I have people leave other fields to come to dialysis because they walk in and they see us sitting down and they think we're not doing nothing. And for the most part, for a lot of times you're not doing nothing, what you should be doing, but no, but we're, we're sitting there and, and we're pretty much um, waiting for the treatment to end. We should be making assessments every 30 minutes, getting supplies and everything ready. So for, the treatment to end, we can prepare for the next treatment. But, you know, as it comes, that's not the case. Dialysis is a highly, highly complex uh, process that even though it looks like you're just putting two needles in someone and you're starting the treatment, there's certain steps in process that go along with that. And if they're not done in sequence, or if you miss a step in this process, that could mean the difference between life or death, okay? There's no gray areas in this business. So for instance, What if you put someone on dialysis and your caregiver and you're rushing to put someone else on and you're not paying attention and let's say you leave that saline line open. Warriors, please pay attention to this because I've seen this scenario many times. There have been times where caregivers have been put in a position of trying to rush and in that process left the sailing line unclamped. Now, let me get that line and show you what I'm talking about.
This line right here, okay? This line should be, it should be double clamped. This part right here is where the saline line comes, okay? So in my example, let's just say you're you're not paying attention. You're what? Say the, the technician just put you on, say boom, 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 got you on in two minutes. And a lot of times when they do this, they don't fill in that first line to get your assessment. The machine normally car carries it over, but what in case the machine is not working, they got to come back and document your information in. But let's just say you start dialysis. They hook you up. They got two other people waiting, and this is unclamped. And the other, and the other blue clamp is not on. This is unclamped. I've seen this many times. The saline line is now open. You, the blood pump is spinning at 400, 450. The say, look, what if your saline bag is half filled to 500? It's just spinning, your bag goes dry. What if your air detector is not set because the technician or nurse forgot to set the air detector and that bag goes dry? Guess where the air is going to? It's going to the warrior. And we have someone who experienced that same situation, Darnell uh, Carley, warrior in Georgia. He had an air embolism. They gave him air by mistake. So that can happen. That can happen. And that's why it's important to check everything. The technician should be teaching you when possible to check everything, to make sure nothing happens. This, as I was saying, this is a highly complex procedure. Certain complications can happen. If the technician or nurse doesn't know how to treat that complication, someone can die. So this is not easy mentally that's why you need to decompress after a shift but no the company doesn't do that they want you to keep going you have war and you have uh caregivers working up to 14 15 16 hours a day doing dialysis treatments come on you're working on someone you've been there 12 hours you're tired someone's sticking your arm and they're tired I mean, that sets up all red flags for uh, complications and, 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 and problems and mistakes, mistakes. Also, the caregiver should be checking catheter access sites for signs and symptoms of infection prior to start of your treatment. Oh my God. Let me, man, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that, Miss Baxter. Wait a minute. Let me finish. Let me, I want to, I want to address that. Also, the caregiver should wear a mask when opening catheter caps and you should too. So they should be placing a mask over your face if you have a catheter and they should also be wearing a mask as well, not to breathe because we all have staff in our nasal flares okay under here we all have uh staff so you know you don't want anybody to breathe on your access site with no mask on um so that was the last of what the caregiver should be doing uh washing their hands and changing their gloves before seeing you Look, look, feel, and listen. Access, always clean over the skin of your access before needle placement, rotating the sites, avoiding sticking aneurysm and pseudoaneurysm. Teach you, when possible, to properly hold your uh, site uh, to prevent needles. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Teach you, when possible, to properly hold pressure to your access site when needles are removed after your treatment. They should be checking your catheter access site for signs and symptoms of infection, which include uh, pus, discharge, draining, redness, um, 
swelling prior to starting in the treatment. Also, you want them to do this because at the end, when you get off and they clean it and they notice that you have an infection, then you got to stay extra to get antibiotics when you could have got it during the treatment. And they should also be wearing a mask when opening the caps. And you should also be wearing one too. Um, this is the end of the uh, kidney disease education moment. But I want to go back and address Miss Baxter, uh, her comment that she made about her brother. Let me put this back up, see if I can. I'm sorry. My brother died on the machine, bled to death out of his catheter. You are doing good. I am a social worker. If you need help for services, job apartment, immigration, GED, ES, training, et cetera. Well, I'm a caregiver. I'm a, well, Dallas is ex nurse, Ms. Baxter. Um, I'm not doing dialysis at the present time due to a workplace injury. But could you could you help warriors in other states um, with those services or just in your state where you're at? That, that would be helpful if you can do something international for the international community. I know they're overseas, but even national as well, because some social workers at dialysis units are not doing a good job. Not all, but I've heard warriors say that they're not getting the best uh, utilization out of their social workers. Who else is on here? Um, I saw some comments. Joyce, yes, you can die and know uh, oh, okay, okay. We need to talk, get you on the show, and do a a, a special show for that. I, I can send you some dates. Joyce Martinez, thanks for tuning in, Joyce. Um, really, thank you. Where are you from? Yes, you can die, and no guarantee you going out that chair. But Miss Baxter, how did that happen? Um with your brother bleeding to death at, at dialysis w was he not being monitored properly was he was he not hooked was the catheter not hooked up well okay brotherly love okay okay from philly miss baxter i'm i'm definitely want to hear your story anxious to know how that happened because that shouldn't have happened at the dialysis unit no situation like that should ever happen at a dialysis unit that's why they call for 30 every 30 minutes walking around i know doing blood pressure checks and just checking on on people not letting the dialysis machine just take the pressure I've seen this happen as well. People not physically going and checking on the person, not being in the area. I've seen it all so common. Okay. You say, I will and must share this after 12 years of dialysis. This is from Lisa Baxter. Thanks for watching and, and supporting the show. I got a kidney, six siblings. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. 12 years of dialysis, I got a, okay, I want to check that out. I got a kidney, six siblings on dialysis, two aunts and uncle, my mother-in-law, watched the Lisa Baxter show on YouTube, share, subscribe, thanks. We got to work together. Absolutely. A matter of fact, Miss Baxter, I just found out about your show, baby several days ago so i was going to reach out to you to see if we can get you on the show and do an interview but i saw a show with one of your loved ones and i believe one of the topics was intimacy i believe but yeah man we we gotta work together to this is the only way we're going to beat kidney disease is through education prevention and advocacy.
Okay, you're right. We we, we definitely got to work together. It's not, and yeah, you're you're right. We, we we definitely. That's why I work with Jared and Jeffrey Brown. Those guys are awesome. Sure, absolutely, Vincent. Absolutely. So. Let me just tune this up. So, Vincent, you want me to talk about pump speed? Um, all right, I, I'll give a a, a quick, um, pretty much um, in service on the pump speed. Now, the pump speed normally, well, it acts as the heart. So, you know, you got the kidneys and you got the artificial kid. Um, the artificial kidney acts as your na your natural kidneys. And then the, the dialysis lines like these are supposed to act like the, the veins. I'm using kind of like physiology. So these are supposed to, you know, be like the veins and you got the needles. And so the blood pump speed, the blood pump, is supposed to pretty much correspond with the heart as what the heart would do inside you, pumping blood throughout the body. In this aspect, the blood pump speed pumps blood throughout the system, okay, at a certain rate. Now, you have patients. Good night. Good night, Lawrence. You have warriors who run at certain pump speeds determined by the nephrologist. Now, when we start a warrior out on dialysis, thank you, Dora. My co-worker, Dora Keenan, excellent dialysis technician, many years, over 20 years, doing a great job. Thank you, Dora. But the pump speed, Vincent, when, war, when you start out with an access and you have a fistula, they normally start you off with 17 gauge needles and your pump speed, even in the hospital, when you first start dialysis, the pump speed is very important because when you first go on in the hospital or dialysis, the nephrologist normally sets the pump speed start off at 200 or 250, two hours or two and a half hours, and we're not pulling much off. So then your second treatment, they normally increase the pump speed to maybe 250 to 300. And then the third, by the third treatment, they increase the pump speed to 400. But Vincent, what does the pump speed, the purpose of that is to pump the blood throughout the throughout the body, and it also helps with the clearances. So the pump speed, your access, the kidney, the artificial kidney, and the dialysate, they all work in conjunction of each other. They all work, they all have to work together to get a safe treatment. I mean, not a safe treatment, but an adequate treatment. So if your access is working good, you got the right filter, the right bath, and your blood pump is running at 150 or 200, you're not going to get a good clearance. You're not going to get a good treatment, especially if you have a catheter. And we all seen this where some warriors had catheters and they're not working properly we have to reduce the blood flow rate to get a good flow. And if you reduce the blood flow rate down to 200, you're not getting a good clearance. Some warriors can't run at high blood flow rates because of their heart. They may have heart issues. And so it may be contraindication, contraindicated to run at a high blood flow rate. You may have to run a warrior at 300. You have warriors who do nocturnal where they turn the blood flow rate down to about 250 or 300 doing nocturnal because they run for long periods of time. So they're able to slow the treatment process and get a nice good treatment if you're doing nocturnal. 
So the blood flow rate is important. It's determined by the nephrologist when you first start dialysis. It can be adjusted. Some, some warriors start off, like I said, when you start off with your needle size, um, when they go from 17 gauge to 15, I mean, I'm sorry, when you, you start a warrior off and you're using 17 gauge with a fistula and you increase the size. So 17 gauge needles, which are the orange ones, Wow. Wow. That's crazy. But when you start off and you're using 17 gauge needles, you want to go with a blood flow rate of 200 to 250. When you're doing um, 16 gauge needles, which are the green ones, it's normally 300 to 350. And when you use a 15 gauge needle, you're going to about 400 to 450. 400 to 450, and when you're using a 14 gauge needle, which is the largest, you're going up to about 500 to 550. Could be 600, I haven't seen that. But let me tell you the reason why with the blood flakes as well. If you can see right here, inside this needle, um, kind of like the, aluminum or the hub right here so you got if you can see that that hole right there can you imagine blood coming through a large if you know it's about about um i want to say six ounces i believe or maybe six cups of blood, uh, don't quote me, but about 250, 300 cc's of blood coming out of your body at one time. Now, can you imagine the blood circulating through that needle at a pump speed of 450, 500? That's, that's really high, all that blood, the velocity coming through there. And so the alarms are being monitored so this this is serious but with the blood flow rate that's how again it's determined from the orders that the nephrologist write but it can be adjusted to certain speeds uh, that could be dependent on uh, many factors the needle size uh, heart condition size of a patient Lot, lot of factors to that. And I hope I answered your question, Vincent. Um, I didn't want to get real specific into any um, medical jargon or terminology or or anything that you know wasn't understandable. I try to make this as, as simple as as possible, and yet to be to be effective to show you how serious this is. Um, even though, again, it looks like a simple process, but it's, it's really not. It's really not. And it could be emotionally overwhelming. Okay. Oh, you're welcome, man. You're welcome. This could be emotionally overwhelming, especially if um, you have to involve yourself in the CPR process if a warrior happens to have a cardiac arrest on the machine. That could be a draining, draining uh, experience afterwards. And I encountered many of those type of experience and still had to go back to work and function in my job role. So uh, thank you guys. I kind of went over a little over the time, but I think that that's very important the information that I shared, I know it's long. Uh, please recommend this video, this education moment. Try to point out different um, different time slots where I may have mentioned something uh, that was important enough. I believe everything is important, but something that may be of value to you 
that you could take away to your unit uh, when you go back to treatment and also share with other warriors. Please share this video as always. Tune in Sunday morning for Sunday morning transplant coffee talk as I talk to kidney warrior and lesbian Merlin resident Jill Dale. Uh, I hope uh, Jill, I hope I said your whole name right. But yes, Jill from out of Lesby, Maryland. She has a, man, wonderful story. But she ended back on dialysis after 14 years uh, having a transplant. And she's going to tell you her story, how after 14 years, um, having a transplant, how an unfortunate situation caused her to be back on hemodialysis. Please tune in this Sunday from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, USA, as I talk with Jill Dell, kidney warrior from Lusby, Maryland. This is something that you don't want to miss. Again, Thank you for all the warriors who watch. Ms. Baxter, uh, thank you for tuning in. Joyce Martinez, uh, Vincent, Donna, Tissot, please let us know as the surgery gets close for Uncle Nick. Um, who else? Jared, Jeffrey. Man, y'all guys are awesome. Uh, Angela Mason. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Carrie Villasana, Villasana, Lawrence from the UK, and everybody else. Please, guys, share this video. Um, Y'all, my main support system right now, but just share. People will come back and, and see this. I try not to focus on, hey, Dora, good night. Thank that's Dora Keenan, y'all. That's a co worker. Um, that we worked together for a long period of time. We joked when I used to work with her back and forth, bantering against each other, but that was our way of dealing with the high stress of the job. But we we had our moments, but all in all, Dora, if you're still watching, I love you. You know, thank you for support. You know, you you came to my wedding. You you always been supportive of, of Miss Karen, and I just want to thank you so much for all your support um, while I was at you know where. I'm not going to even say where I was at. So, thanks. Oh, Tiffany Armstrong. She watched. I saw she was a coworker, very good technician. So, guys, thank you for your support and watching. Again, tune in tomorrow, I mean, Sunday for Sunday Morning Transplant Coffee Talk. Thanks for watching, guys. And go to the You Own uh, Urban Health Outreach Media Facebook page and check out our videos, education. Thanks, Dora. Love you, too. Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching. Peace and blessings. Stay safe. God bless you.